Good day, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners, and thank you for listening. So I know your appeals voice. What's that voice? What? What? That's what? not your normal voice. That's good day, Thomas Jefferson podcast. That's I, that's your voice make, right now. You're making fun of me. No, I'm not. I'm saying you. you I, your, I I like to have many voices. That's your that's your typical voice. Well, actually, that was a little smoother. <laughs> You know, but no. What but, bugs me is when I when I'm when I'm speaking to the president, I get excited and I I. Just like Theodore Roosevelt, Jefferson. but you know, there, there's, what's this got to do with this the show? But remember the late night FM announcers that would they would get that kind of sensuous voice, like you're listening to Tony Robbins, the I, jazz I, specialist. See, you can do it too. Yeah, but I you you you, you know what it is? It's proximity effect. These wonderful. 50, 60 year old German microphones, Neumanns that were using. Neumanns. U87s, the Lord God King of voice microphones. And if you talk back here like you do, it's your diction, it's clear. But if you get up close. You want to me it, to get closer? It, All these years? It, it's it, like it, this far in, it, and you're it, now teaching 50s, me basic it, microphone protocols? In the 50s, these guys learned this. I you did. Know, you they, want me to be. You you want want me to, to, okay, I will. From yeah. now on. Mr. Madison, I urge you... Well, put your headphones on. You could hear that. I, I can hear it without headphones. <laughs> I could hear it in Vermont. What, but, but Mr. Madison. Oh, see? Mr. Madison. So it's 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 a little it's, brassier when I get away. Pro, yeah, it's proximity So you got to get effect. right in here. Yeah, and, and people like me who have marginal pipes compared to people like you who have superior ones, sometimes... All we, the world's a stage, and all the men and women help. merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts, his so acts... People could listen to that being all seven day. ages. And then once in a while you get too close and you get a p- proximity. I do have a P-pop. Yeah, it's called Well, proximity. this is good radio, don't, don't you think? This is why they well, send in the short, big bucks. Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have fun this week. We talked to some of our old friends on the uh, correspondence. As, Chrysler. Yeah. And uh, Pat Brodowski. The, the, the head gardener at Monticello. And also a, a pretty edgy conversation with Bo Wright, who I just have a, a, a place in my heart for. He came to North Dakota, visited us. That's um, all it takes? My wife Jan and I had a wonderful dinner with him. You were uh, engaged elsewhere and couldn't join us, but um, he is such a bright guy, and he is... Uh, we like just, Sometimes we like to catch up on our, our far-flung correspondence. But let's, but let's get serious and then get to the show. And the serious part is that um, you put a call out during the show that we would like to find a, a conservative correspondent. And, you know, we get a lot of mail from people who would like to talk to you, but usually they're one issue, folks. Like, a, I've got a very thoughtful letter from a guy who wants to talk to you about the Second Amendment, which I think you, I, I gave you the email I think you should take a look at. But you made a call for somebody that's a conservative that we can engage I don't like with. The idea, I don't like the idea that, that, that we could be perceived as, um, as necessarily Democrats or liberals. I, my whole career such as it is, has been an attempt to to stay in the in the conversation and to be reasonable. And I don't like strong talking point ideology of any sort. I, when I lived in Boulder, Colorado, I found that oppressive, that kind of automatic, knee-jerk, always on the enlightened, liberal side of every question. I, I find it objectionable to be in hard red uh, discourse too. I think the great majority of the country belongs to the center. I think that there are uh, cases to be made for every president. And whenever a president, you know, I've never been elected to anything, David. Nothing. And I know what it takes. That it's unbelievable that anyone can get very high up. You know, you go to the city commission, maybe county commission, and your state legislator, or maybe you become governor or state senator. To get to the, to become a United States officer, is essentially impossible. No, you have to sell part of your soul to do it, don't you? Maybe, but almost no one gets there. Mm -hmm. Elections matter. So when you elect Barack Obama, he's your president. When you elect Lyndon Johnson, he's your president. And we should never pretend that that this is some sort of whimsical thing. So we all bear responsibility, and when someone is elected, whether it's someone you hate— People on the right said that Obama was the worst president in American history. Or if it's the other way, people say that Trump is the worst president in American history. Keep in mind a couple of things. It's pretty evenly divided, number one. So it is, if yes. you think you're right, 
then you're at odds with 40 or 50 or 60 million other American people on these questions. That's worth thinking about every day. Secondly, most people tune much of this out. Most people are not political junkies. Most, most people are not following the Ukraine story. People are following the World Series. People are following the NFL. People are following their daily lives, their children in school, the harvest. We need to remember that most people are living their lives, and they're, and they're reasonably okay with their government. You know, uh, no matter what your politics, aren't you reasonably okay with America? Of course. We've never had it so good in many respects. So I would like to get a rational Trump Republican conservative or, or rational Trump populist conservative. Or, or just how about a rational conservative, somebody who uh, respects and espouses the Republican ideals? As, as charming as Bo. Well, no one can be as charming as Bo, but but charming like Bo, who would come on this program and, and say, well, now, come on, let's talk about this and not just go to Sean's and Rush's talking points. You know, Yates has this line, David, he says, the best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. The best lack all conviction and the worst are filled with passionate intensity. We're living in an age of passionate intensity on both sides, maybe more on one than the other, but on both. And until we calm down and take a deep breath well, you know, and talk I, and disagree rationally as friends, we're doomed. It's our right to gr- disagree, but we don't have to demonize him. Well, it and that's just, with, a, that's just like a natural behavior now. I hate that. It comes up in our conversation this week with, with Brad Crisler um, yep. that everyone's publishing now. Everyone can do a song. Everyone can do a video post. Everyone can do a blog post. Everyone can do a meme up a book. And so when you have that, it's great. It's the democratization of discourse. On the whole, I'm all for it. I know you are too. But there are some problems. And one of them is the anonymous post. So I got one. I was I, I posted this thing. Maybe you saw a statement by John Adams about what an ideal diplomat need, needs to know. And of course, it's impossibly high-minded. We get that. And I just said something slightly snarky like, how would that mirror look today, you know? And so I got this long thread, but one of them was, one of the last ones was, um, well, uh, uh, President Trump couldn't read it because he can't read at a third grade level. Think, okay, now you really helped this along, did you? You know, you really think that helped the discourse along? Because we we know that's wrong. That kind of thing where people just go for the easiest possible aggressive thing that they Who can say. Who has taught us to behave that way? Who has taught us that the other side is so evil? There, there's blame on all sides here. You think that it comes more from one side than the other? I'm not so certain that it doesn't come from outside the sides. I think what I mean when I was growing we, up, we talk about in, in uh, involvement, foreign involvement, creating chaos. I look at that. If we're you, convincing us that we're, I mean, trying to divide us as a people. If you look at the at, at, at discourse, pop culture, sitcoms, movies, public discourse, what you hear in a mall in 1960, and then look at it in 2019, you see essentially a collapse of civility. And that's not a political thing. That's a cultural thing. Yeah. And, and it, I think it came Not about from enormous prosperity and freedom, unprecedented freedom in the history of the world. And we are not educating ourselves well enough to know how fragile those freedoms are. And so at some point, people just said, I'm just going to let the world have it. And then that has created this culture of incivility and vulgarity and, and aggression. You know, one of the, the one, if I if someone said to me, "What's the one lesson you've learned from doing Thomas Jefferson for thirty years?" I would say, "Artificial good humor." And you know, we've talked about this. Get a nasty letter, write back a polite one. They almost always apologize. We got to go to the show. You got a plane to and, catch. And Chrysler, you know, every time you want to say Chrysler, he turns out to be a a world class, wonderful human being. Yeah. Thanks to all three of them this week, they're all world class, wonderful human beings. And with that, sir. Let's go to the show. Indeed. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Seated across from me now is the creator of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. May I say the award-winning humanity scholar and author. Author? Clay Jenkinson. I am an author. You know what? I just today uh, signed a two-book contract. Did you? To do a book on Jefferson. Um... A, a version of becoming Jefferson's people. Well, that's big news. And my book on North Dakota. That's big news. Yeah, this is big news. And now, of course, I'm fighting a deadline. 
Uh-huh. That's the problem. That's but, why you're on such pressure. Right? Uh, that's some of the pressure. And so, um, but I'm thrilled because I was in Norfolk, uh, which I love. I, uh, WHRO, WHRV, yeah. our flagship. flagship station, then, and yeah. I'm going there a couple of times in the spring to do this sort of Clay Jenkins and Unplugged thing. Uh-huh. Um, this comedy hour. Humanities comedian is what I have become. And you're bringing somebody in to do the comedy? Or? Uh, okay. And you'll be here all week. Yeah, great. Be, sure to, be sure to tip your semi-permanent guest host. Uh, but I met these guys and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do this two book contract. And so now this is great because I want what was becoming Jefferson's People, it's going to be a, a recast in some ways. I want it to, um, to get into the national conversation because I, I feel that we are in deep trouble, as you know, and that what we need is a new Jeffersonian movement of civility and rationality. Let's l- let's make a date when you get back from France to talk about France and to talk about that and, and your upcoming books. But I'm going to cut you short, if I might. You might. You might. Because we have... Another one of your quips? No, 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 no. Yeah. no blah, 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 blah. <laughs> we have three uh, of our favorite special correspondence. friends correspondents to talk to this week. And First up is none other than the the one and only, the lovely Pat Burdowski. Uh, I didn't and, know how that was going to come out, but I'm glad it came out as Pat Burdowski, yeah, right. not Chrysler. Yeah, the uh, he comes later. Yeah, um, um, but she's uh, she's in the garden at Monticello, and we're going to talk to her. She, so, Pat Burdowski, the head gardener at Monticello, we speak to you right. in mid October 2019 from the plains of Dakota. I can tell you we've had a very strong early autumn blizzard, a double blizzard, so it's hard for us to take it seriously, even to think that you're standing outside somewhere. Yeah, yeah, we all, it was cold this morning, it was like 39, had a little ice on my windshield, I wasn't ready for that, and then Everybody had six layers on, and now we're down to T-shirts and about, it's probably 80 degrees out here right now. Wow, and, we can uh, only envy that. And and, and here's the other thing. In, in North Dakota, as you've heard before, you can't really plant a tomato before Memorial Day unless you're very lucky or very careful. And then around September 15th, you're going to run out of BTUs, but even if you don't, you could get your first frost then. So we have that growing season from about June 1st yeah. till about September, about Labor Day, a little a little longer. It always astonishes me that you can grow crops much of the year. Much of the year, yes. So, I mean, things are still blooming. The beans, the okra, um, tomatoes are still producing. We're putting pulling them out, though, because they're pretty um, far gone. We, they've been in the ground since April and um, uh, we have some cherry tomatoes still out and the Castelluto Genovese, but um, basically we're getting ready for cover crops. So we're, we're pulling things out, even though they are still, um, you know, producing. Could you explain to people who don't understand what the purpose of a cover crop is, uh, simply what that does? So it's something that will grow throughout the winter and it um, keeps the soil in place and it also nourishes the soil. The clover, when it blooms, has those nitrogen fixing bacteria on the roots and um, it will um, put nitrogen into the soil. And Jefferson Jefferson was aware of this, and, and they, they understood that sort of chemical reaction of, the, of cover crops? Well, you know, chemistry and soil science weren't really uh, available then, but they did observe, and they all compared notes um, among, you know, all the founding fathers. They compared all the notes about um, rotating crops and planting one thing after another, and he had a number of rotating um, crops, including lucerne, which is alfalfa, and different grasses, and uh, they were really concerned about um, keeping the soil fertile, uh, so you wouldn't have to move. Pat, you're you're sort of legendary uh, as a guide. In fact, we get a lot of mail from listeners about uh, visitors who who have been to Monticello and met you. You're you're becoming quite a celebrity. That's I probably due to the Jefferson Hour. <laughs> Well, we hope so, because you send me photographs. Listen to this, Pat. This is from Josh Wagner, uh, who sends a letter to us, and he said, I'm a middle school American history teacher in Pennsylvania. I'm putting finishing touches on my master's thesis on the logistics and planning of the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, As we walked through the garden, I was looking for crops and flowers that may have been sent back by Lewis and Clark. We came across someone, Pat, working in the garden. We struck up a conversation, and she showed me several things in the garden uh, that had connections to the West in the expedition, including manda and sunflowers. Um, and then they said, Pat, 
talk to my wife and me. She mentioned the Jefferson Hour and that Mr. Jenkinson was the editor. We proceeded on. I've been a faithful listener. And then he goes on to say, you know, I honestly can't say I always agree with your Jefferson Watch essays, sir, but I do love that Pat Bradowski. So <laughs> congratulations, Pat. You're not you're non-controversial. I try very hard to please everyone, you know? <laughs> he says, I'm not always buying what Mr. Jenkinson is selling, but I can honestly say that Pat Bradowski is the very best. And so there you go. Um, oh, so. So, but how much, I mean, some of this that you grow, you eat. Oh, yes. Actually, it's really fascinating to compare. And so, um, like, I've got Hopi blue corn, I've got Cox prolific corn, Virginia gourd seed corn, the Mandan corn, um, glass gem corn, Damon Morgan's Kentucky butcher, Jimmy Red. And so those corns, we're going to grind up this winter and have a little taste off among uh, of cornbread made from those. Oh, wow. So that we can... Yeah, so, so far, the uh, Virginia gourd seed corn always comes out on top as the best flavored corn for corn meal, for cornbread. Really sweet, natural flavor. Pat, what's corn pone? I think it's when they put sort of a cornbread in those little molds, the little cast iron molds. If you don't know, it can't be known. What's hominy? Hominy is when you are um, putting lye on the corn. And it's a nixtamalization process in which the lye, although it's you know, a toxin, if we take it and ingest it, if you put that on the corn and let it sit and cook it, it um, takes that heavy shell off the corn and it changes the endosperm into a protein. And so it's an excellent thing to do for corn. And most enslaved people uh, would do that and have a, a superior corn um, to eat. And I guess the pilgrims probably did it too. We learned it from the Indians, I think. So what's grits and why would anyone north of the Mason-Dixon line ever eat them? <laughs> grits is when you grind your corn and you have the, the crunchy part that you haven't like ground. It's the second time to be corn flour, corn meal. Um, and then you can just cook them like a, like an oatmeal kind of thing. Um, so, and my daughter loves grits. I love your daughter, um, so I, I will try once more, but <laughs> I've never had a grit that I could eat. Um, so what's corn mash, and, and did Jefferson have a still? Jefferson did not have a still. Uh, Washington was known for his distillery. Jefferson had uh, beer making, small beer. You are always a busy woman. We should let you get back to work. I would like to know if there are any um, are there any occurrences at Monticello over the winter months that people would well, be the interested. Well, the wreath ceremony, of course. Well, wreath workshops. Yeah, we have like um, a whole week or a week and a half of wreath workshops. We provide like seventy dried materials and and greens and the not only the lessons. People go home. Everybody makes something different. It's really like an extraordinary workshop. And if people um, go to Monticello.org, they can find a schedule of events there, I'm assuming? Yes. So, Pat, I have one last question for you. Um, I'm, I've been reading all of the correspondence um, of Jefferson in France, which is fascinating. And he keeps writing to different people, including James Madison, saying, would you send me some pecans? Is that how you say it? Or pecans or pecans? <laughs> I don't know. I always say pecans. Yeah, I knew you sure. would. Um, I say pecans. Uh, but anyway, uh, he wants pecans and he says, I need them because I'm going to give them to my friends. And he says, but but pack them in sand. So maybe he's worried about insects getting in them. That makes sense. Also, it keeps the temperature steady. So maybe it was uh, more of a refrigeration. You know, they used to pack carrots and beets in sand and bring them into the house or, you know, into the cellar so that they would stay um, in a comfortable temperature. And also they could potentially force leaves from the beets to eat in the wintertime. I'm not saying Jefferson did this, but I'm saying it's a common practice of the day. Wow. So are, 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 are what you call pecans grown at Monticello? No, we have one tree at Shadwell, you know, um, and we haven't had them here. And I understood that the temperature is not correct for for them. But I would love to to try it again. Are there mockingbirds at Monticello? Oh, my God. Yes. The, we have a spectacular um, array of mockingbirds. And they're always um, building nests and having babies. And so there's, you know, Jefferson had four in the house at one time. And his favorite one was named Dick. Dick. And it went to the White House. Yeah, and he's actually they have a model of of him in the uh, on the secretarial desk in his study now. That's great. But out here in the garden, we have one that always follows us around and and chirps while you know sings to us while we're working. And I've been trying now for three years to teach it to say Thomas Jefferson, and I oh. decided to <laughs> dream, dream dream higher, Pat. Dream, uh, dream higher, Pat. As we let you go, I want to just say two things about Jefferson and pecans. Number one. 
he had a lot of time on his hands if he can be importing pecans to Paris. And number two, if you're sending the pecans in sand, you are not worried about the postal rates. No wonder he died bankrupt. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting is that there were no, um, if you were sending seeds and plants and so forth, there was no postage um, in this country anyway. Benjamin Franklin decreed that um, plants can be shipped for free. You wow. have been a, a fountain of wisdom today, and you're standing <laughs> in the thousand foot garden at Jefferson's right. Monticello, and it's 80 some degrees in mid October. We hear a little breeze in the background little breeze and i'm looking at some ripe figs and i'm going to go down and get grab some as soon as we um, hang up we love you pat Brodowski. i love you too talk to you soon okay it's great to talk to you again and have a great time in france okay bye boy that was really fun she, uh, all the corn things did you have that planned or did it just kind of come it just to came you? out because she started like what 12 varieties of corn you think what are you going to do with it all and then and, I thought, and we got through all that and then she we were hanging up and she came up with another one which was ho- um ho- whole corn whole cakes Enslaved peoples would cook these hoe cakes on hoes. And here's her explanation. Hoe cake is uh, cornmeal, mush, basically cooked with the uh, ashes right on top of it. And then you'd break it open and eat the, I think, the interior. That's great. <laughs> Who knew? She's a fountain of knowledge. And, and hominy, uh, and, lie? What? <laughs> well, lie is how you make um, hominy. Yeah, yeah. As, you, as anyone who's ever eaten corn knows, it doesn't really want to be digested. And so... You find ways. If you grind it and make cornbread, uh-huh. it's it's better for you. If uh-huh. you put in lye, you can break down some of that structure. What I found so interesting in what Pat was saying is you asked her, did Jefferson really know the chemistry of, uh, of, of, of cover crops and so on? She said, of course not. But he, they understood nature and they could observe what ameliorates the condition of the soil. And they, un- they understood things that intuitively that we now can confirm chemically. We need to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. We're having a fun time this week, catching up with some of our old friends, our correspondents from around this country. You know, Pat Bradowski. That was fun. Has been sort of, I won't say inundated, but almost every week I get a photograph from the garden of Jefferson Hour listeners who turn up and they meet her, and they're so charmed by her. It was so much fun to talk to her this week, as it always is. But now we're going to place a call to Virginia to speak with... Another part of Virginia. Another part. Jefferson's Poplar Forest, our friend Bo Wright, what a city councilman in Lynchburg. Right, and he he works for uh, an organization, Protect Democracy, but as he likes to point out, he is not a spokesperson, and his views are his own. But he was... An operative, may I use that term, in the Obama administration. Oh, he's um, a brilliant guy. Yeah. Let's talk to Bo now. Hello, Bo. Hello. Good to be with you all. So how did things lurch on in Lynchburg? Oh, we're doing we're doing well. Um, you know, we have uh, there's there's a lot of stuff happening uh, here, um, especially around public education and uh, a lot of infrastructure projects. But but things are things are humming along here just fine. You know, Jefferson said, uh, if you expect to be a nation ignorant and free, you expect what never has been and never can be in a state of civilization. How would you assess the quality of public education in your part of Virginia? I think we're uh, we're doing well, though, you know, certainly we can always be doing better. Um, we have, you know, diverse populations here with, with different needs. Um, and so I think, you know, our, our education system um, is facing a lot of the same challenges that, that cities across the, the country are, are facing because uh, the 21st century has just brought in brought a lot of challenges to school districts, not, not just funding related, but, but certainly technology is a big one. So we're, I think we're doing well, but, but we're, we're striving to do better. Not to get right into it, Bo, but I mean, this is in some sense why Donald Trump is the president of the United States, because you've just given this thoughtful, nuanced answer about about public education, instead of just saying it's terrible or it's great, you said, well, it's the 21st century and there are some challenges and we have a different demographic than perhaps uh, we had 30 or, or 50 or 100 years ago. Don't you think this is exactly it, that if you, if, if you get someone with a highly simplified, very concrete and determined view of the world that says, well, whatever happened to the, the three R's? Why can't they just teach the three R's? That appeals for all of us, everyone is looking for a simpler view of the world than actually exists. And our resistance to the, the nuances and the complexities of the world is a source of frustration to a lot of people. And if you have a 
political figure who knows how to tap that, you can ride that all the way. You know, President Obama had a sign on his desk and it said something like, hard work is hard, right? You know, nuance is hard. Complex problems are hard. And it's easy to be an autocrat when you're promising that things will be easy, right? That you don't actually, you know, these are, these are simple problems with simple solutions. Well, that's just not how the world really, really works. Bo, let me try to, um, to, to move into this sort of distinction I want you to, to help illuminate. So, okay, it's one thing for uh, a populist to come along with a relatively simple set of narratives about how you can fix things. Uh, There's nothing particularly wrong with that. All politics is, in a sense, uh, oversimplification because otherwise you would just be in endless symposia uh, and think tanks. So we get that. We may or may not agree with the diagnosis or the, or the, the plan for the national recovery, but, but it's understandable that a populist can come along and say, I'm the one who can fix this. Here are the problems. They're really simpler than you think. Uh, we've overcomplicated this. I know exactly what we need. If you trust me, I'll address those things. But now you add the second element of what appears to be not just corruption, but corruption so deep that it, it it trips the deepest anxieties of our constitutional structure. We could not necessarily have expected that, right? I, I, I'm I going to treat that question not as rhetorical. I, no, I mean it. Yes. Yes. Well, you know, I, I think that we had we had we already had plenty of evidence that Donald Trump himself was not particularly well read uh, or um, observant of, you know, basic American norms and traditions. So yeah, I, I think we had we had a heads up that that he was going to govern in a style that was not only going to be completely different from how pretty much every other president in American history has governed, but that he would um, also flout these norms and institutions. And and there were some you know who said, well, uh, the office of the presidency once he assumes that 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 mantle. Uh, will make him presidential. He will. He will conform. There to will the be office. a turn. There will be a turn. Right. And I think what we have we have seen, and as as I think many people feared, that he instead would conform the office to him. But wait a minute. Uh, but wait a minute. Um, we knew this. You saying we knew this going in. Yes. That he didn't present himself as something um, purer or more constitutional. Uh, he was elected. Well, I think that's true. We went in with eyes open, um, and certainly, I, you know, the the will of the voters should and must be respected. Um, but the Constitution leaves open the possibility, if the president commits high crimes and misdemeanors, as defined by the American public through their representatives, to remove a president from office, to impeach a president. Um, and I think that we couldn't have foreseen necessarily. Well, while we knew that Donald Trump was something of a loose cannon, there was no way, and I think that, that in which we could have seen that he would actively invite a foreign power to meddle in American elections. So, do you think, from what you now know, that the current president has committed violations of the Constitution and abused power in such a way that he should be removed from office? Well. Yes. I mean, he said in front of the White House, he actively called on other nations to meddle in our elections. Now, his defenders say, um, assuming that they grant you the the basic fact set that you've put forward here, they say maybe, you know, maybe it's not good, maybe it's not ideal, but it doesn't rise to the level of impeachment, that grave thing that has never actually happened, impeachment followed by conviction, that this would this is not substantive enough. It's not significant. It's not grave enough to merit that sort of uh, extreme constitutional um, answer. Uh, so I have two questions for you. Do, a, do you think there's validity in that argument? And B, if this isn't an impeachable offense, what would be an impeachable offense? Well, I think I think your your second question leads to my answer to the first, which is I, I don't I don't know then. If this isn't it, if if asking uh, uh, if uh, you know asking a foreign leader 
with, while withholding military aid to this leaner's country to do something that would influence an American election, if that's not grave enough, if that's not serious enough, if that's not impeachable, then I don't know what is. Bo, I was in Chicago the other day and a man came up to me and sort of got in my face. He was a huge, tall man. And he said, I don't like the way you're talking about President Trump. I had been very mild um, in my discussion and way milder than you, kind of a liberal hothead. But uh, <laughs> but he said to me, Trump is the best president in American history, and I resent what you're attempting to do. And I said, I said to him, well, uh, do you think it's okay uh, that the president invited foreign interference on in our election, in fact, um, essentially blackmailed a foreign country to either comply with that uh, meddling or 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 to be in the peril of having um, the Russian Federation bearing down upon them. And he said, that's just nuts. He said, he has to do that kind of thing because the corruption in this country is so great that the only way he can save this country is by bringing in foreign auxiliaries. I'm 100%, he didn't say auxiliaries, I'm 100% okay with that. Mm -hmm. So there is where we are. Now, I don't think that he speaks for the 45 million Trumpites necessarily, but but Bo, there's where we are, that your friends and mine too, you live in Lynchburg, for goodness sakes, that's even redder than North Dakota. Your friends uh, believe that, that either that Trump can do no wrong or that the wrong that he's doing is somehow justifiable because A, it ain't Obama, B, it ain't Hillary, C, it ain't Biden, D, we got to save this country and we're, the swamp is so deep that that um, some somewhat extra constitutional measures are going to have to be taken. Surely you see that. Oh, absolutely. And and this sort of goes back to a conversation that, that three of us uh, have had before um, about the the silos in which Americans live today, political silos, where we, we aren't really talking to each other. We're certainly not consuming the same media as each other. And I think that certainly both sides um, are are um, uh, tempted by conspiracy theories, um, talk of, say, a deep state. Um, but this is especially prevalent uh, if you turn on on Fox News. Um, you know, and when the president since day one has been has been critical of the of the intelligence um, America's uh, intelligence agencies and disputing expertise and poo pooing the conclusions of law enforcement um, and consistently and in increasingly sort of hostile and aggressive ways. Um, it's no wonder that if, if if that is your media diet, if that's all you hear, you might, too. Uh, become inclined to think that that you know you need to go out and invite foreign interference in an election in order to ensure that it actually is not corrupted by domestic influences. Um, so I can you know I, I think that this sort of gets at a much deeper rot in our political system and how we how we have a dialogue with each other. That whole situation of um, people being convinced how bad things are. It's gone on for quite a while, and I guess my concern is is that if these are the new norms, what's going to happen when the next president comes in? I mean, it, you know, it, it could be a Democrat, it could be a Republican, but are those norms going to become the norms? Well, they must not be the new norms. How this administration has governed in large part um, must not be. But, uh, agreed, but do you think that we'll revert well, that's why I think it's so important that we actually place guardrails on, you know, executive authority. But if they're ignored, if they're going to be ignored, what what difference are they going to make? And I guess, you know, I would come back to uh, to ask Clay, what would Jefferson do? Oh, he would farm his farm um, at Poplar Forest and turn away from all of this madness. I will, you know, I take your question seriously, David. Um, you know, the founding fathers thought about this. What happens when the separation of powers breaks down? What's the mechanism? And, you know, as I say always, Madison gave us quadrennial elections. So in November of 2020, we have the opportunity to either affirm the current president or to retire him. Uh, that's a tool that we take for granted, but it's an enormous revolutionary tool that was put in the heart of our Constitution. And as you know, Bo, there are many people who say at this point, let's just let the election decide here in, in, in 2020. I, I think this moment is so important 
the House must pursue um, an impeachment inquiry. And, and the facts will lead uh, to, I think, hopefully, a just conclusion. But it's really important that the Congress now assert its its uh, co-equal, you know, status um, within our within our governing system, and insist on checks and balances here, um, at the expense of whatever the outcome is of the next election. I mean, I understand that 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 strategically, uh, it might or might not make uh, political sense uh, to do this, but I think it's terribly important for the health of our democracy um, that Congress stand up and say, no, 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 you you can't go out and and actively encourage another country to meddle in our elections, and, and we're just going to let you get away with it. It just it can't it can't be that way, um, even even if it may improve his political chances um, come come next November. So um, I'm, I'm, I know a lot of other folks are, are mindful of those political consequences, um, but I, I think that can't be our primary concern right now. It has to be the um, the longevity and the health of our country. So last week I wrote that that the Senate is, in a sense, the last guardrail um, under a separation of powers doctrine of the Constitution. And I assume that the Senate is going to acquit. If that happens, what's the worst-case scenario? There are so many worst-case scenarios. What what could happen uh, to our country in, in the next couple of years? And, and, and you know, you, you did uh, share uh, last week um, that you're a generally optimistic person, um, or <laughs> cheerful, I think was the word yes. you used. <laughs> yes. And 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 I, I too am, am generally a, a cheerful a person and and pretty optimistic about the future of our country. I, I know that we have struggled through tough times before, um, cataclysmic times before, and our country has has emerged roughed up, but I think the stronger for it. Um, but I, th- I think there are a lot of, uh, of really sort of terrifying scenarios here. Um, if the president is acquitted, he may then feel that, that there really are no constraints on his power. Um, what happens if he defies court orders? Uh, what happens if he um, declares uh, the election of 2020 rigged? Uh, what if he deliberately tries to rig it, right? What happens when we remove these constraints on, on an executive? Um, and that, to me, is really concerning. Could the president, as you as you uh, as you pointed out, could the president uh, implement martial law? Who would stand up to the president in that case? Uh, so I, I think that there are, are a lot of um, scenarios here that are deeply, deeply troubling. I think America is very resilient from the time of Jefferson standing up saying we are all Federalists, we are all Republicans, to the time of Gerald Ford saying is now a time to heal. Um, I, I think I think America is very resilient and, and with the right leader in place, um, that can happen real quick. But I, you, you've been so generous with your time, Bo, and I know you need to get going. But, but I have just a couple I quick things really to say. I really want to thank you for, for taking time to be here Bo, today. Bo, I want to just say a couple of things. First of all, to both of you, Nixon turned over the tapes. Nixon turned over the tapes. I think we're yet to determine that, right, Bo? Yes. That's going to be the big question. So... Does the president uh, accept the the court? There were five court decisions last week, uh, none of which were in the president's favor. Uh, He's almost certainly going to have to turn over his taxes. He's almost certainly going to have to allow people from the administration to uh, testify before Congress under subpoena. We haven't tested this constitutional crisis yet. We've tiptoed around it. We've been dancing on it. Second, I want to say this to you, and I want to say this not to try to balance things out for those who will be really offended by this conversation, although there will be people who are very offended by this conversation. but And you don't have to necessarily try to defend President Obama, but I was deeply disturbed by the reign of executive order. I know why he did it, uh, but it made me uncomfortable. And, and I think that we've eroded, I guess the larger point I'm making is that we've been eroding the separation of powers doctrine in a number of presidencies from both parties for quite a long time. Do you agree or disagree with that more general point? I agree completely. All right. So then finally, I'm going to ask you this, and I want to, want you to give a yes or no answer because I want to clear this up. You're in the city council of Lynchburg, right? Yes. Is it true or untrue that you called for Roanoke and Richmond to send money and dig up dirt on your political opponents so that you would be reelected? Can you, <laughs> can you confirm or deny that you called in Roanoke? Would you like to see the transcript? Yes. I, uh, but and I, even uh, then, it wouldn't matter. <laughs> but it wouldn't be a verbatim transcript, would it? No, no, that's that's true. It, it'd just be, uh, it'd just be a, 
uh, reconstruct it. You have not confirmed, or you, again, this is that Weasley kind of political, you know, you have, you refuse to say <laughs> no, whether no, or not you no. let Richmond intrude. We've had such a nice conversation. <laughs> I, I, Thanks. Yeah, we, 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 we love you, Bo. You're going to get some mail over this. We'll ship it on to you. Yeah, I hope to come back to the barn again sometime soon, guys. We love you, and, and, and thank goodness you're not a barn denier. We'll talk to you next time. Talk, take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. As always, a spirited, informative, and interesting conversation with Mr. Bo Wright. And, and let me say that something that matters to me, David. Uh, I love Bo, of course, and I do believe he's right about the constitutional crisis we're in. But I would like to have a, a rational, principled, conservative correspondent on this program, too. And so we're on the lookout for people around the country who might be able to, you know, I don't, we don't want to get into uh, brickbats. So if you take the noise out, if you take all the, the talking point noise out and just try to get to the center of these arguments, I'd like to have that discussion. Right now, we're going to take a short break, but we'll be back with another conversation in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour for our third and final conversation this week. We are so pleased to have back the legendary Mr. Brad Crisler. Hello. Hello. Boy, that was a quick answer. <laughs> I'm just sitting waiting by the phone to hear from my friends who never call me. <laughs> Well, thanks, and welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, sir. Yeah, how's the snowfall? It fell. It fell and went away. Now it's now it's uh, warming up, and the streets are dry, Brad. But the uh, it was, I mean, it hit us hard, and you don't, you know, it was weird. Every year, you yeah. kind of think, "Am I ready? Am I ready?" And you this never is, really are. Yeah, it was it was much earlier this year. So well, yeah, it's a bit early. Yeah, I have two or three things that I'd like to talk to you about. Is there anything that you would like to talk about What's first? on the mind of the great Chrysler? Oh, n- everything and nothing. You know, there's probably a lot of people who don't know who he is, Clay. Would you like to Well, a Nashville legend, uh, this songwriter, uh-huh. um, a, a collector of miniature paintings. And also, creator. And a creator of them, too. Uh, that, if you uh, recall, I have oh, a no, wonderful... Boy, I, I get it, that you got it. Not, uh, the yeah. portrait of Adams right, in you, my yeah, office, very nice painted for you. by very, very, Chrysler. Very nice for you. Yeah. Uh, but he also is uh, an expert on, on um, history of... of painting particularly 18th century you know, I miniatures. think that means he likes me best oh, I think so too. <laughs> and he came in, he brought his family out in some sort of a trailer yeah he did a wonderful yeah, then so. they were on this sabbatical and toured the country and he was trying to find his voice again and he found it and here we are well that's a pretty good setup so meanwhile we did call to talk to you Brad now what was it you were going to say <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm enjoying hearing uh, my story being told. That, <laughs> which yeah, parts I'm, would you quibble with no it's all true uh, yeah all of that is true uh, I was the first to uh, break the 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 barrier the barn barrier vis- yeah, visiting the barn that's a yeah. fact uh, yeah, yeah i know many have followed in my path so there are still some many. skeptics yeah. but not uh, many. the last time we had any lengthy uh, correspondence which really wasn't all that lengthy but we it was a matter of a huss and dalton jefferson guitar and you were inquiring about that oh, do you yeah. recall i do yeah i was i was curious as to what the price tag of such a wonderful instrument would be you know uh-huh. i'm semi semi-retired now from uh music although uh, well, I'm completely retired in terms of, in terms of writing songs oh. every day for a pub for a publisher, but I have 4,000 songs that uh, have momentum that went right on by me and, and continue to have a life of their own, which is which is great. You wow, know, that's, that's a catalog. Catalogs, yeah. 4,000. Um, I think that's about right. Yeah, wow. Spread, spread amongst about six publishers. So. Uh, and yeah, I just had a song recorded by Kenny Chesney, who was a, a big uh, recording artist. Um, again, a song I wrote two years ago that kind of fell into his hands, and just um, you know, he's a he's a really big artist. I haven't had a song recorded by him in some number of years, so it was uh, it was a pleasure to see that my songs uh, possibly will outlive my productivity well, well congratulations let me ask on you that. this question and you don't need to answer with any specifics but i don't really understand how this works so all right four thousand songs and, and kenny chesney is, is is recorded one on the basis of that do you are you able to buy a couple of pizzas or do you buy a new <laughs> boat or is it an island in well, the caribbean all, yeah it's all speculative right because uh you know the last kenny chesney song i had recorded 
uh, was probably 10 years ago, and it wasn't a single, meaning it wasn't released to radio uh, and, and go up the charts or anything. It was just on the album. But the album itself sold almost 7 million copies. And so I, you know, the, the residual royalties, mechanical royalties from that sales was significant. Uh, these days, nobody sells 7 million records, of course, because you know, music is distributed and monetized differently, as we know, uh, which has affected content creators profoundly. It would, uh, it would certainly pay for both my daughter's colleges and Whoa. weddings and uh, all of that. So uh, we, we at the Chrysler house have uh, fingers, legs, and everything crossed for a, a Kenny Chesney single. So this is more than just like the kitchen remodel if this goes viral. Yeah, it's a, it's a big, having a hit is a big deal uh, even, even today you know, in, in the digital realm. Um, it's, it's significant. Uh, that the difference is... In the digital age, uh, even Kenny Chesney is one of the biggest artists in our format, and he uh, he only sells you know maybe a million records at the most. So it's um, it's not what it used to be. So how how hard can this be? Your wife left you, and the kids are in the field, and the, uh, <laughs> the, 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 you, you go down to the yeah. pub, and the bartender right. takes the I call. I can tell you haven't listened to country music in about how hard years. is this? You know? <laughs> that's, that's a great segue because one of the things I wanted to ask you about is uh, the the new Ken Burns Dayton Duncan documentary, uh, Country Music. Have you seen any of that? I you know what I haven't. I keep having people ask me about that. And of course, I'm a huge fan of Ken Burns. I've loved his work for many years uh, and have gone through his master class, actually, uh, in terms of how what his process is. It's in- incredibly important. I think he's the best. He tells our story uh, as Americans better than anyone else. Uh, but it's a little too soon for me, the, the history of country music. I- I've been... Uh, you know, neck deep in that business for over 30 years. I've just recently retired from it and just trying to kind of recover. <laughs> and so I, I can't, I'm really looking forward to watching it, but I, I need to, you know, give, I need a little buffer, some space to recapture uh, and recover some context that will give it its due. Honestly, um, honestly, I think that that uh, it, 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 certainly the first, two or three episodes might just do that for you um and it, you know, it is ken burns and i love his work too but um i you know i i get to the end credits and up pops written by dayton duncan and right. i, I want to write that guy another fan letter yeah he's a friend to the show i know i have heard from people who i really respect that uh, this this documentary by Kim Burns is their favorite. So, Brad, much. I want to get to your your work with miniatures here in a minute, but I want to ask you one question. I, I, apparently, I, I've I've missed a few decades because I'm still locked into uh, <laughs> Tammy Wynette here. What's the right. what's the current zeitgeist in country that. music? My kids listen to all kinds of music. They don't listen to genres or formats of music. They listen to all music. And because of that, and because that's been the trend over the last few years, and because of the digital global village we live in, the lines that kind of demarcate uh, radio formats have kind of uh, grayed and faded and, and in some cases disappeared. So the format is so huge to accommodate the listening audience that is younger than it used to be. There are really no no lines between, you know, what is country and what is pop and what is top 40 and things like that. There's always a truck and you're on the freeway somewhere in West well, Texas. Yeah, well, there, and, no, there is frequent, frequently a truck included. And then there's uh, kind of a, there's always a kind of a Lee Greenwood moment where whatever else has gone wrong. I God bless <laughs> this great country of ours. We got to get you updated on dropping some names here. Lee Greenwood is just not, not doing you any favors. <laughs> well, all I can say is that I turn on country music. You don't have to listen for more than 10 minutes before there's a truck on a freeway somewhere. Maybe so. Yeah. But, you know, perhaps the production and the kind of the lyrical content and the delivery of all that has modernized to the point that now there's just not a lot of lines between formats. You're, you're really a master at that. And I've seen you up close and personal doing that watching you work uh, when you were here at Makoche, but you know, I, I, I want to go back to that thing about the lines being sort of grayed out between genres because I think mm-hmm. that's a really good observation. I, I remember years ago when we built 
the studio uh, where, where I work, Makoche. It was sort of the advent of uh, all of this digital stuff coming out and people being able to make records in their bedrooms on laptops. And people would say, well, don't, don't you worry about that? Isn't that going to ruin your business and take it all away from you? And I would, my response would be, no, it's great. Why should we be the only ones to have all that fun? Right. And it's, well, it is, you know, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's well, like... the obstacles to producing... Uh, commercial music uh, in terms of gear and, and uh, expense and overhead has, has, you know, like many things because of the microprocessor been diminished so that, you know, those barriers to entry to the business uh, have been obliterated. So there's, a, you know, a kid in his bedroom can make a record that, you know, in three weeks could, uh, could you know, make him a superstar globally. But it also creates a, a surplus uh, and yeah. a lot of noise out there yep. because uh, just just like uh, you know publishing and books uh, and podcasts and blogs and all of that, uh, there 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 are great you know benefits to everyone having a publish publishable forum, uh, but there also uh, can be detrimental in turn in terms of having to curate that content and kind of wade through a lot of noise to get to some really good stuff. So. There are positive and negatives. Yeah. My preference is a bet closer to yours. I still like making records the old-fashioned way. Absolutely. Uh, real, real, real people, real instruments. In fact, I just got done with a project, a vanity project that I've been working on for a year with a group from from Fargo called the The News that I worked with back in the 1980s. Nah. And we, we all, knew then. We all got back together, <laughs> uh, you know, just proving that we're still relevant at this age. And it's the most sure. fun I think I've had in years. Well, Brad, let me awesome. ask you, I was, I'm sorry I wasn't paying attention. I was ordering a rhyming dictionary from Amazon <laughs> so I can get me one of them kitchen remakes. But wow, both... Your children into a universe. Wow, this is when you must be a genius because that is good, a recompense for your art. And we love you uh, that you're so modest about it because you have every reason to be shouting from the highest hill in Nashville. Very Jeffersonian of you, sir. It is. Your very your your humility is um, is is remarkable and 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 very. Um, admirable let's go to miniatures for a moment sure. once again i've done a poor job as which is why i'm again the semper semi-permanent temporary <laughs> or the stammering by not, by, semi-permanent by not setting this up properly and that is is that you, you're not writing songs as much anymore but you are involved in art and particularly in miniatures and i'm That's certain right. that many of our listeners don't know that could you give us just a a short brief yeah, sure that? sure I, I i began uh kind of being curious about this art form, which was only popular from about 1760 to 1850 uh, during the advent of photography, where it, the art form kind of died out. And uh, it, it's just basically people would sit for, for you know, full-size oil portraits, but um, they, they would also, many of those great painters also painted watercolor on ivory miniatures for kind of private uh, memorials and and to, to be worn by ladies around the, the neck. It was a very popular art form um, during the late 18th century. And, and I became fascinated with it. And uh, like the Jeffersonian thing to do was to, you know, figure out who the experts were and kind of the history of the art form and just dive right in. So over the last seven years, I've, I've learned a lot about the art form and then began to uh, learn about the art of restoring and conserving the pieces. So it's become a, it's a hobby that became uh, a passion that became then kind of a, a lucrative uh, job. I'm enjoying doing that right now. And you do some painting yourself. I do. I, I not as much as, as, uh, as I would like to do because I'm working on so many, so many of the originals I do, you know, as part of the, the art of restoring, you know, I, I, paint uh, on originals sometimes doing restoration but every once in a while I'll do a commission or I'll do a portrait of, of somebody in my family I also do some oil painting as well but but really just a stress relief I'm not an artist uh, in the true sense and uh, but I really enjoy uh, learning uh, about this uh, fascinating, really quirky form of art. The last question, off completely off topic. Uh, you know, we've been talking over the past couple of weeks about the constitutional crisis that we're in, if you want to call it that. How's this all playing out? What's the mood in Nashville about this whole national crisis? 
Well, it's interesting. I mean, we get to interact with lots of different people with lots of different opinions, both in the academy here and just in everyday life. And I, ironically, I was just at a lunch meeting with a musician and, and their family from Canada. And I was they were asking some of the same questions. What's going on in America? And you know, I tried to take an optimistic viewpoint. And I think most people here understand that kind of the questions that we're wrestling with now, you know, brought... Uh, to to bear by the present administration and the situation we find ourselves are are kind of uh, they, they they were saying are Americans you know figuring out that democracy is not working and I said no nah, I don't think it's that it's it's that we're finally having to have conversations about the nature of how we govern ourselves in terms of the constitution and and uh, separation of powers and kind of what we've allowed to happen, you know, over the of the last hundred years and and kind of, you know, bending over backwards to govern ourselves with this 18th century document. And the conversations we're having to have, we're having in public, you know, <laughs> on the evening news and through the 24 you know, hour news cycles. But they're conversations that we have to have. We've had them forced upon us now. And that's not a bad thing. You know, We with a lot of these things we need to be figuring out. What does it mean to be a republic? What does it mean to hold you know, our constitution uh, sacred? And how, how are those things hurting us and how are they benefiting us? And what does it mean? Uh, you know, what do separation of powers mean? I think people understand that we need to have those conversations and that no matter how contentious and 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 these are there there's no bones about it we are in uh kind of a state of perpetual constitutional crisis and those questions are going to have to be answered and some of them will probably be painful answers but i think we'll come out on the other side of it having created possibly to steal a phrase, a new birth of freedom. Wow. You know, it is in our history to wrestle uh, and to have deep disagreements, sometimes unfortunately ending in in profound loss of life and bloodshed. Hopefully we can avoid that. But at the end of the day, that our republic is born anew uh, and with a new spirit. And so I, I think we have to continue to um, embrace that kind of optimism to know that um, the experiment that we've tried continues to evolve uh, and continues to uh, experience birth pains. But at the end of the day, um, something on the other side may be better than it than it has ever been. Uh, I'm with you, citizen. I think that was yeah. beautiful. I love your seriousness. I love how, how seriously you take this culture and – uh, of course, your work. I have a thought here. Just a quick thing. One more song, maybe. Sure. And here's just t- tell me if I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, my wife was catting around on the wrong side of the tracks, but I was uh, on, in my truck heading to uh, Texas, and we had this whopping national constitutional crisis, and I didn't know where to turn because every part of my life was just falling apart. But then I turned on public radio, and there was the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and everything began to be clear. <laughs> and I cheered up, and and I met a woman who who loved me, and 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 would never leave me. Don't you think that, like, one more song? I'll tell you what. I'm not going to try to write a book about Lewis and Clark. Why don't you try not to write a book? Well, I think that is a world-class song, (laughs) something on the other side. Oh, you're breaking up. The connection is going fast. Hey, hey, Brad, thanks for for calling us, and uh, thanks for setting us straight with uh, your uh, wonderfully placed optimism about our country. It was great. Thank you. Uh, it's always good to hear from you guys. You guys are a light in my week. Yeah. Again, our thanks to all our correspondents this week. Please join us again next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any show for a $12 donation, please call 701-575-0727. 
This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.com and on Apple Podcasts. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.com. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at Makoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Bach Cello Suite No. 3 in C Major by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program, Through the Eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thank you.